everyone, my name is Daisy and I am a Physics and Math Tutor at Lanterna Education. Today I'm going to be presenting a video about Chapter 4.3 of the IB Syllabus, which is all about the polarisation of light. Today's video is going to be split into two halves, so in the first half I'm going to be talking about the theory behind this section, and in the second part we're going to look at an exam style question and I'm going to talk you through some tips and tricks on how to get the best marks on that question. Alright, so let's get started. So, I mean, the first thing really to consider is if we're going to talk about polarised light, we kind of need to have a good idea of what light's actually like before it's polarised. And probably so far in physics, whenever you've seen light or a wave, you've probably drawn it in some kind of way like this, like a bit of a sine curve. Um, but actually, in reality, what light's doing is it's actually oscillating, not just in one dimension, but in the other direction as well. And obviously the reason we draw it just like this most of the time is it's actually quite hard to draw that just on a plain sheet of paper. So what we can say about light ordinarily before it's been polarised is that it oscillates in all directions. So in this di diagram you can only really see it oscillating vertically and horizontally. However, if we kind of looked at that um, at an angle, so if we sort of looked at it from an angle sort of here and made that like our vertical axis, we would see this red line looks like it's doing something here and the blue line is doing something here. And we could actually resolve that and what we would see is if we resolved the um, directions of oscillations, we could find that it was oscillating in every single direction by the same amount. But again, that's really hard to draw. Um, so this is kind of a good mid-ground. We can see it oscillating um, vertically and we can see it oscillating horizontally. Okay, so that's, that's what light looks like before it's been polarised. What happens when we polarise it? So polarised light is light that is only allowed to oscillate in one plane. So when light passes through a polarising filter, the way we tend to draw it is, as you can see in this diagram here, um, if you've got your horizontal and your vertical and you pass it through a filter and the filter is um, oriented vertically, all you're going to get is that vertical light passing through it. So when we put light through, um, unpolarised light through a polarising filter, we lose 50% of its intensity. And what we get out is plain polarised light. And what that means is, like I said, the direction of oscillation is limited to only lying in a single plane. Okay, so what more can we do with that? Um, if we um, take that polarised light that we've just created um, in this diagram and we shine it through another polariser, we could might want to see what happens in that case. So if we um, align our polarising filter in the same direction as our light that is currently polarised, all of that light will get through absolutely fine because it's you can kind of think of it like this diagram, right? It's sort of like a, um, a almost like a gap between a fence post, and um, you know, fences sort of look like that. The light can get through because it's going in the correct direction. But if we rotate that filter by 90 degrees, you can see that actually none of that light can get through because the filter is in the wrong direction and the light is oscillating this way, the filter is like this, and it just can't get through. So if it's anti-aligned to the polarisation of light, 0% of that light will pass through. Alright, so it's quite simple then looking in those two cases. Um, uh, we can sort of see what happens when it's um, vertical and horizontal. What's also worth considering though is what happens if we consider the light before it even goes through, before it's even polarised. So if we have our original unpolarised light and we call it I0 and we shine it through a first filter, what we're going to end up with is I0 over 2 coming out of that filter. Um, if we then shine it through this second filter here and it's vertically aligned, we're still going to have I0 over 2, right? And all of that light that goes into this filter, so I0 over 2, is going to come out of that filter. In the other case, um, if we have our um, second filter anti-aligned, we're going to get 0 out of the other side. And some important sort of definitions here. This first filter that we use to polarise the light is called the polarizer, And the second filter, which we use to analyse the light or to sort of determine um, the angle at which the light is um, polarised is called our analyzer. So we have a polarizer and we have an analyzer. So, so far we've considered what happens when our polarising filters are aligned and anti-aligned, but obviously there's a lot of angles in between that that we might also want to consider. So let's imagine we start with our unpolarised light I0, we shine it through its first filter to make it vertically polarised, and as we said before, we're going to lose half the intensity. So the intensity in the middle here will be this um, I0 over 2. 
Um, and then what we're going to do is we're going to shine it through um, an analyzer filter, which is at an angle theta. And what this means is we can then work out the angle of light that the um, intensity of light that comes out using a law called Malice's law. And Malice's law tells us that the intensity coming out of a filter is the intensity of light that goes into the filter times cosine squared of the angle. It's important to remember that cosine squared of an angle means cosine of the angle squared. Um, that's, that's all that means and that's probably the best way to type it into a calculator. So in this case, because I0 over 2 is the light that goes into this analyzer filter, the light that comes out of it is going to be I0 over 2 times cos squared of theta, because I0 over 2 is essentially the I0 in this case, it is the intensity of light going into this filter. Alternatively, questions might be set up slightly differently, and they might give you the I0 that is going into the filter, and you will need to find the intensity going out, in which case you won't have this factor of 2 here, we'll just have I0 cosine squared theta. So what's really important with these questions, and I think often um, trips people up, is that you've always got to work out what situation am I looking at. Is my original light, my I0, the light that um, is unpolarized, or is it the light that is plain polarized and going into my filter? So it's always important to remember whether or not you need to halve your intensity before you solve the problem. And we'll look at an example of this later on, which hopefully will illustrate it a bit more clearly. All right, so as well as using these polarizing filters to polarize light, light can also be polarized off a plane surface. And a really good example of this is um, using water. So if you have light like in this diagram that is shining at the sea, the light that comes off of it will be polarized in a direction which is parallel to the per surface of that water. And the polarization won't be 100% perfect, but it can be pretty good and it will polarize it to a relatively large extent. What's cool about this um, is we can use it in a number of different ways and often with things like photography. So here on this left hand side you've got an ordinary image that someone's taken of this um, sort of pond um, per area of water with pebbles underneath it. On the right hand side what they've done is they've in front of their camera lens used a polarising filter and so the light that comes off of um, this, the light that is reflected from this water is going to be reflected, polarised, 90 degrees. Um, parallel even to the surface of the water. So what the photographer has done is they've used um, a filter which only allows light that is um, polarised at 90 degrees to the water to come through. So what this means is the, um, the photographer cannot really see this polarised light that's, um, being, that's shining off of it. They're not getting this reflected light off the surface of the water. And what that means is the light they're seeing is the light that's reflected off the bottom of the water. And what this means is you can see much more clearly the detail underneath the water because what you're not seeing is the reflection off the surface of the water. So in this case you would want to use a filter that was sort of shaped like this because the light that's coming towards you from that water is going to be polarised like, like that. Uh, you can also see this in sunglasses that are often used um, by sort of sailors and people like that because you don't really want to be constantly sort of seeing this massive glare of light coming off the water. Um, it's just not very easy to see what you're doing, it's just not very good for your eyes either. So if you can block out a lot of that light by using a polarising filter, it's going to be much more effective. Alright, so as I said earlier, um, in the second part of this video, we're going to look at a quick question. So this question is taken from um, a cognitive question. And um, what I would really recommend you do, as I said in um, my previous videos, is if you feel fairly comfortable with this video, with this content, pause the video now, go away, have a go at the question, and then hit play when you want my explanation of the solution. Alright, so the first part of this question asks us to explain what is meant by polarised light. And this is one of those standard definitions that's just worth sort of being able to recite. And the answer is, it's light where the oscillation is restricted to a single plane. So that's sort of something you need to learn. And definitions are really easy if you know them, really hard if you don't know them. So just worth learning before the exam. Part B asks us, what is the intensity of light that is transmitted by the polarizer? So we're told that we get 10, um, our intensity before, is 10 watts per meter squared going towards our polarizing filter and that is unpolarized light. So after the polarizing filter we will have polarized our light and that means we will halve our intensity. So we will just end up with 5 watts per meter squared. 
Part C asks us, the polarised light then falls on an analyzer positioned so that its transmission axis is 30 degrees to the polarizer. Determine the intensity of light that passes through the analyzer. Okay, so in total what we had then is we had our original unpolarised light. Looks something like this. Then we shine it through um, a polarizer to get light that's only in one direction. And then we shine it through a filter which is at 30 degrees. And we want to know how much light we get out at the end of that process. So originally we had this 10 watts per metre squared. After we shine it through our, um, our polarizer filter, we're going to have 5 watts per metre squared. So the light that's going into the analyzer is 5 watts per metre squared. So when we use Malice's law, we want to use Malice's law on the 5 watts per metre squared. So what we're going to do is calculate I is I0 cos squared theta. And in this case, I0 is 5, that's the light going into the polarizer. And cos squared theta is cos squared 30 degrees. And if you put that into your calculator, you should end up with 3.75 watts per meter squared. Meter squared. Great, and then part D, the last part of this question asks us to determine the angle of transmission axis if the transmitted intensity after the analyzer is 2.5 watts per meter squared. So looking back at this diagram we drew in part B, instead of knowing this angle here, we don't know this angle, let's just call it theta. But we know that the light here is 2.5 watts per meter squared. So we can use um, I is I naught cos squared theta. Um, we know I naught, we know I, we don't know cos squared theta. So let's write that I over I naught is cos squared theta. And we know I is our intensity after our filter, it's 2.5. I naught is 5. So that's a half. So what this tells us is that cos of theta is the square root of a half, and therefore that theta is cos minus one of the square root of a half, which is simply 45 degrees. Okay, so I hope this video has been helpful for clearing up any understanding about this topic. Um, if you'd like more information about online tutoring by tutors like me who all obtain the top grades in IB Physics, check out lanternaeducation.com for more information. So thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.